we've had a chance to meet the Vector, which is a smart, modern, C++-ish version of the C-style array, and hopefully you're at least a little bit convinced by now that the Vector solves a lot of the really annoying problems that arrays give us in C. For example, the fact that arrays have a fixed size, that arrays don't know their own size, and that if we're not careful, we can run off of the end of them. Vectors, if we use them correctly, solve those problems. Um, but now we should see if we can tackle any other uh, annoying C things that we would rather not have to worry about anymore now that we're working in a higher level language. And of course, I think the next, the obvious thing that comes to mind is strings. If it doesn't come to mind, obviously, it's because you've probably blocked it out because of how annoying strings are in C. And if you took 111 with me, you'll remember that when I brought it up, I pointed out that strings in C are sort of an anomaly. C is such a low-level language that strings have to be done with so much micromanagement, whereas in most languages, strings are really easy to work with because most languages have to do a lot of text processing. And I suppose C does as well, but unfortunately in C, you're stuck with the low-level C idiom but you're not in C++. And it gets even better because obviously we might recall that in C, there's no such thing as a string. In C, all you can do is store, for example, an array of type char, an array of characters. And you use a null terminator to avoid having to keep track of the size separately. And I suppose, I mean, you know, that's a bit of a nightmare for all sorts of different reasons. It also can give rise to security problems because when your strings have a a fixed size, but you're performing manipulation of, of text, maybe you could end up running off the end of an array. So I suppose we could try and solve the problem incrementally by saying something like, well, I know that um, in C++ we've got this wonderful type vector, so instead of using an array of char, I could use a vector of char, so it could grow and shrink. But it's even better still. We don't even have to worry about vectors of characters. We can give up on all of the annoying C string things we've been worried about because C++ provides us in the standard library with a purpose-built string type that is even better than a vector of characters would be because it doesn't require us to worry about things like null terminators. And it provides some extra operations that are purpose-built for text processing. And of course, also because the rest of the standard library, whenever it wants to work with text, uses this type. So it's also a matter of, I guess, conformity. Uh, so there's a type called std colon colon string. And you will notice that unlike a vector, this type does not involve angle brackets. And it would make sense that it doesn't. Um, those of you that are watching this video and know a lot about the, the deep, dark magic in C++ do know that there's a clever way you could use angle brackets, but I'd rather not talk about that. For the sake of this course, string doesn't require any angle brackets because unlike a vector, where I might want to make a vector of ints or a vector of floats or even a vector of strings, unlike that, a string is just some text. It's a string of text, and so I don't need to parameterize it. And so you'll discover that usually when we make strings, we just write std colon colon string. So task zero here is to create two strings. One of them is called s1, and then give it some text. And so you'll see I'm using uniform initialization. I could use C style initialization, but again, if I get into the habit, it's easier to maintain the habit later. Here I'm setting s1 to be the string hello with a capital H. And then down here, I'll create a new string called s2, which is the string world. Great. And so let's just, like we did with vectors, walk through the basic operations that we can do, the most common use cases of strings. Um, in addition to the video, of course, there's a bunch of notes I've posted that cover a few other more esoteric things you might want to do with strings. Um, but they're the kinds of things you're going to see in the labs and whatever anyway. So um, for the sake of the video, we'll just walk through sort of the obvious high-level view of various things I can use strings for. My goal is to prove the point that strings are much more convenient than the analog in C. Okay, so I've created two strings. They're two separate string objects. One contains a string hello, one contains, contains the string world. Let's start by printing something out. So we'll print out um, s1 contains, and I'm going to print it out inside square brackets, as you'll see in the next couple of videos, because I want to make it obvious what's, whether the string contains any hidden characters or spaces or anything. Uh, but the square bracket I'm printing, of course, is just part of the output string, not the actual stored string in memory. Okay, so I print out the value of s1. I could print s2 as well. Hopefully you can take my word for it that s2 does. If, I can, if s1 contains what it's supposed to, maybe you can take my word for it that s2 does as well. And there you go. s1 contains the string hello. Okay, next question. Task number two. Construct an empty string called s3. 
There are a few ways to do this. We know from C that the idea of an empty string is natural. I may want to have a string of length zero. So I could do this. I could make a string and store nothing as its contents. I could also do this. I could use uniform initialization and I could provide empty brackets. As with many of these sequence style types, when you use empty brackets, you're telling it to go with whatever the default value of that type is, to construct the type in the default way. And for a string, the default string is an empty string. So I could do this. Um, I could even write this. We know, as I've mentioned a couple of times over the past couple of videos, that um, this is a very odd notation to see because we're used to an uninitialized variable containing weird undefined random garbage. It turns out for a string, as for a vector, even if I don't provide curly brackets to initialize, it will be initialized to its default value. That is because, although there is that rule we know from C that if we don't provide an initializer, the type doesn't get initialized, there's a different rule in C++ that supersedes that rule in certain cases. We're not yet ready to talk about that, so that, that's a topic from week seven or eight. It has to do with how these small appliances are designed. Um, but it turns out even if you don't provide curly brackets, this is a valid initialization for a default string. As I mentioned in the previous video, to avoid having to have that argument now, let's instead always do this. If we always provide curly brackets, nobody will disagree that we are always initializing our variables. Okay, so S3 is now an empty string. Um, and so we actually can use our strings S1, S2, and S3 much in the way you would use a vector of element type char. So for example, I'll abrogate the sequence of tasks here and actually try this out. Um, the character at index, let's do index one of S1 is, and I'll try calling dot at, just like I could on a vector. So a string duplicates many of the operations of a vector um, because you often want to use a string as if it were just a sequence of characters. Oh, whoops, S1 dot at, I'm going to do index one. Because indexing starts at zero, I should expect the result to be the letter E. And there it is, it's the letter E. And I'll point out, just like I have in a few videos so far, that isn't it odd and suspicious that somehow I pull out the single character, which we know characters secretly are numbers, but I pull out the single character from the string and push it into C out, and C out is able to figure out that I want it printed as the letter E and not just some number. So another, one of those things to hold in the back of your mind. One of the, another piece of evidence that there's a lot happening beneath the surface that isn't obvious to us in C++. Um, and similarly, if I wanted to, I could ask the string to tell me its size. I could do dot size, or dot, it turns out there's also dot length, which is the same thing. Uh, okay, so I make an empty string S3, and now I want task three is um, to print out the concatenation of S1 and S2. And just like how in uh, two videos ago when we talked about vectors for the first time, we were opening the door to a whole new way of viewing the world, what we're about to see here is pretty amazing from the point of view of a C programmer. Now, if you come from Java or Python, this is the least interesting thing in this video, what I'm about to do. I'm going to use an assignment statement to set S3. Okay, that in itself is not exciting. So in fact, what I'll do is just, um, I'm going to print out S3 to sort of do this task incrementally. So S3 contains, and then I'll print out the value of S3. Okay, so. Of course, I can use assignment statements to copy one variable into another, just like I could for any other type. As long as the types are consistent, I'm allowed to do that. We'll talk more about that um, next week. But uh, So here, I set S3 to be the, a copy of S2 on line 26, and sure enough, S3 contains the, the value world. What I'm going to do now, though, is this. S3 equals S1 plus S2. If you recall from C, I mean, there is a plus operator, but we weren't allowed to use it on everything. We were allowed to use the plus operator only on um, low-level pieces of data, like ints and floats. I wasn't allowed to add two arrays. I wasn't allowed to add two variables of a structured type. And yet here, I've made a smart object, S2 and S1, are of type string, which is clearly a sophisticated modern C++ type, not an int or a float, and I'm allowed to use a plus operator on it. And if we think about it, so what does it mean to add one string to another? Like, what is that supposed to mean? What is a natural addition operation to define on strings? I think for me, what would make sense is if I want to add S1 and S2, I would get everything in S1 and then everything in S2. In a sense, I would mash both strings together. 
And so if I do that, I should expect, it turns out that operation is called concatenation. And I just said, that's what I think addition should be. Sorry, I should have been clear. That's what addition actually is. When I add S1 and S2, I am concatenating those two things together. And the result, so string plus string, is going to be a string. And I'll store the result in S3. One other thing you should be very careful to note here is, just like if I add any other two variables, adding S1 and S2 does not modify S1 or S2. It just creates a new string, which is the sum of those two strings, the concatenation of those two strings. So we'll try that out. And there we go. S1 contains hello. I guess I will print out S2. There's just something about it that seems asymmetric if I don't. And we can see S1 contains hello, S2 contains world, and then S3 is the concatenation of the two. Notice that we don't get a space added in there for free. If I add two strings, I just get the contents of one string followed by the contents of the other. And just for extra clarity, after I've done that operation, I'm going to print out S1 and S2 again. I want to prove that when I did that addition, I didn't modify the input operands. Notice how S1 and S2 are still just hello and world. The result of string plus string only creates a new string. It doesn't modify the strings that I provided as input. Okay, so what else can I do with a string? Well, one other thing I could do, as I mentioned, a string duplicates many of the operations of a vector. Um, I can say length, I, I can actually ask the string to tell me how many characters it contains. Um, notice that S1 and S2 both contain five characters, and S3 contains 10. So length of S1, and then I'll print out S1.length. And uh, you may recall, if you took 111 with me, I, I talked about this, that when I talk about strings, I often use the word length to refer to the number of characters in the string. In C, this is significant, because in C, the length of the string and the size of the underlying array could be different. Um, whereas, of course, in C++, there's no notion of that, because the string is a small appliance. The string's job is to represent a bunch of characters. We don't care what's happening behind the scenes. Um, and so I, used, I like to use the dot .length function to ask each string for its length. And you can do that, and of course, if you modify the string, the length will, when you ask it for its length, that'll come back with whatever the current length is. Here I've got S2, S1 and S2 are 5, S3 has 10 characters. Um, there is, if you want to use it, dot .size, just like a vector. You can call dot .size on a string, and that's a synonym. So if we notice, if we try running that, it works, and it still returns 5. Uh, I like to use dot .length because it helps me internally to recognize it's a string and not a vector. It's sort of helpful for me to deliberately treat strings and vectors differently, even if they have many operations in common. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that for a vector, you have to use dot .size. For a string, you can also use dot .length. But you're welcome to use dot .size if you want to. Um, okay, and then uh, I can also, one other vector-like thing that I can do with a string is I can iterate over it. Now, a string is a sequence of characters, so I would say each character is C in S3. Uh, so I'm writing a for each loop over my string. I could also uh, write a loop using indexing, and it points out the task is trying to provoke me to do that in a minute, so I will. Um, okay, so I'll print out each character as I get it. So each character, character, colon, and then I print out C my for each loop. And it will iterate over the characters in the natural ordering of the sequence. And for a string, it makes sense. The natural ordering is just left to right. Uh, so I'll try doing that. And then I'll write a, the other kind of loop to do the same thing. And so there's the string. It's There it is, all 10 characters. So this will be, we'll call this um, task 5a. And then it says to use two different types of loops, so I guess I'll have to do task 5b using a, an old-fashioned indexing loop. Now, it went unsaid in the video about for each loops over vectors, but if you for some reason really don't like for each loops, you're welcome to just use indexing style loops. There may be a point when you sort of have to use a for each loop, but in general, as long as your code works, you can choose whichever loops you use whenever you need to write a loop. So here I'm going to iterate over every index of the string for i starts at 0, um, i is less than s3.length i++. Notice how it's an unsigned int because the length of the string is an unsigned value and the compiler will complain otherwise. So here I'm going to print out character at index and then I print out the index is and to get the character, I would have to write s3.at index i.
And there we have it. So we've got character index zero is H, character index one is E, and so on. Uh, and if we look back up to task 5A, it's still there, and we're still using a for each loop. Um, and one last note before the end, there's one other thing I can do with strings that is very common, which is I obviously might want to modify strings as I work with them. Uh, and you can do that in a variety of ways. It turns out strings do support push back, although be very careful because push back is designed to add one element to the sequence. So if I do push back, I can give it a single character. Notice how the character has single quotes around it because it's one character. Uh, and we'll notice that, of course, then I have a string of length 11. And its last character is x. Um, when I use strings, I tend not to use this notation. Although pushback is very valid, I actually use this. So just like how the plus operator can be used to add two strings by concatenating them, you can use plus equals to add extra characters to the end of a string, modifying that string in place. So here I'll add some characters. There's what, eight? <laughs> There's eight extra characters. And I used plus equals to modify the string as I went. And we can see now the string has those eight characters at the end. And you'll notice in C++, it's very common to see people building strings uh, by using plus equals to iteratively add single characters or whole strings to the end of the string. And I hope this entire example has proven strings in C++ are way easier to deal with than in C for a lot of different reasons. One thing you, you should have noticed in th this whole example, if you're familiar with C strings, is that nowhere did I care about a null terminator. Nowhere did I worry about the string getting too long for its array. The strings, because they're this clever small appliance, this special type um, STD string, the strings take care of that themselves. All you need to worry about is how to use the text. That's it. You can ask the string its size. You can add more characters to it. You can do whatever you want. You don't need to worry about how the string is being internally represented in memory. So another one of those huge benefits of this small appliance view of the world.